Mic check, check, mic check. Cool. Okay, we're good. Um, hi, everybody. Howdy. Thanks for having me today. Um, these slides do have a PDF version you can download by accessing that QR code. It's hosted on GoFile. Um, I've removed some of the videos because I can't play videos on PDF. Somebody finds out how to do that, let me know. Uh, but yeah, go ahead and download that. Um, the slides will be available and posted uh, you know, later as well. Feel free to share that with your friends. I will give you five seconds to get a picture of this in. Two, three, four. Oh, awesome. Thanks for coming to the talk. Um, we'll let some people trickle in here while I'm doing my intro. Uh, so just a quick who am I? Oh, I forgot the other projector over there. Uh, my name is Angel Gamboa. I'm an InfoSec doer. I don't feel right calling myself a professional. Uh, I'm a senior hacker at a place, a 3D printer enthusiast, and I've been in the game for six years now. That's fine. I am trained in multiple disciplines in terms of vulnerability research, network penetration testing, web app testing, physical vulnerability assessments as well. Uh, I'm a proud member of DC 316 out of Wichita and occasionally drop by AHA and SecAC. Thank you all for those prospective communities. Pretty cool communities. You should check them out. I do have a disclaimer here. So the following presentation does deal with security and adjacent topics. Consequentially, some of the content may be of adult nature. This content is handled in a professional manner by the presenter team, and I hope you can handle it with respect as an audience. Additionally, content is provided for educational use only. I take no responsibility for any actions by the audience as a result of this. Let's behave ourselves. Um, if there are any you know, of those adult topics that you don't want to see, please do leave the room now. There's some more people coming in. That's kind of weird. Uh, <laughs> so what problems do we face as modern attackers uh, in terms of adversarial simulation? We face the problems of rising costs, conspicuous devices. You know, you have your Pack 5, your, your Red Team toolkits, etc. cetera, uh, your Wi-Fi pineapples. You know, the more tradecraft you have, the more problems you have when you want specialized equipment. You also have the restrictions that certain countries or state entities might impose on certain break-in tools or burglary tools um, in terms of possession or usage during one of your authorized pen tests. And, you know, these vary state state. Check all your local laws and regulations when you're doing these kinds of authorized tests before you go out. So, where do we come in? We think of Batman, and he's got a lot of cool gadgets. He has money, right? And you can break into buildings that you could probably already buy. Uh, but we look at raccoons, and you know they look cool. They eat trash, and they break into anywhere. I mean, you have raccoons breaking into any building that people would kill to be inside of a building uh, unauthorized and get all the goodies, right? So here's the agenda for today. Uh, we've covered who I am. Um, we're going to go over how you present yourself, my own kit for physical security and testing, uh, commercial tradecraft tooling primers, and we're also going to replicate those with our own variants, and I have video demos along the way. So let's talk about physical evaluations really quick. It's a great way to show internal network isn't too hard to reach. Uh, there's lots of prep work that goes into it, even without all the legal paperwork um, into that, right? If you're uh, part of a large consultancy, they may handle a bunch of that. There's still a bunch of paperwork you have to do. Um, and there's not always repeat scenarios you can use for your pretext when you're self-engineering people. You can't just reuse those all the time. Most of the time, there's templates, right? What does preparation for a gig entail? Well, preparation, preparation, preparation. Um, you have to assume all that paperwork is taken care of, and you don't have to deal with that, any of the legal uh, badness, of course. But you have to set up your objective connections, your out of office, your checks, your trash schedules, get that information, look at their tech stacks, their surveillance schedules, antics, behaviors, company culture, and look at their contingency planning. And you got to have luck and then read a lot. So I just want people to know that most of the time it's not just breaking into a place, it's opportunistically doing your research, and then once you find an opening, going in. One of these things you can read is fire code. There's the NFP80, the standard for fire doors and other opening protectives. Uh, these will document how certain doors should be within certain structures. These are basically like an RFC for doors and buildings. Same with ADA compliance. You can go online and find the ADA accessibility standards, and this is where a lot of tradecraft comes from for under the door tooling. You'll see this little, uh, this little margin here. Uh, 34 to 48 inches is where you can grab that operable handle. So let's talk about packing for pretexts. Uh, there are a few pretext archetypes I've selected here because they're more of what I'm comfortable doing, uh, at least when I started out. So I have the authoritative one. You can be a help desk or IT person. You can be some C-level title that uh, hates people. I don't know, but something like that. Uh, you can have mutual bonding. Bonding. You can uh, light somebody's cigarette. You can have the door hold open, or you can say, hey, yeah, I'll let you in. I'll help you with that box. 
Um, you can be an inquisitor, you can be an interviewee or a job candidate or an ignorant end user. Uh, you can choose all of these. You're not restricted to these at all. You can mix and ma match them as well. But uh, the main thing is to play to your strength. Game is game. If you get inside the building, that's cool. It doesn't matter if you're this or that. That's cool. Play to your strengths. So more on pretext backing. Um, there are treasure troves of information online for employees in terms of fundraisers, company meetups, etc. You want to get your clothing for your archetypes and covers. And the way I frame out these interactions and script them in my mind and on paper sometimes is I use props to perform a skit and have a punchline. So the skit may be, okay, this is how uh, uh, the whole skit's going to work out, right? The location, etc. Uh, the punchline is my goal, what I'm after. So take, for example, I have a clipboard with an RFID reader built inside and I have coffee and in my hand at a kerchief, you know, that's my prop, right? So I want to get a clone of somebody's batch, and that's the skit. Oh, dang, you know, could you hold this for me? Uh, I just got this coffee all over my shoes, I gotta clean it, so I, I hand you this clipboard, okay, oh gosh, I'm cleaning this, and now you have a clone of the batch. Uh, so try to frame these ideals out in a playable scenario that you can go through and uh, interact uh, with people. So in terms of uh, packing more, you want to pack just enough tooling when you're going on site. If you do perform wardrobe changes on site, that's cool. And that's gonna entail more packing for those on-site encounters, but it's not always required. Um, you do wanna have raw material handy in the hotel room, so wires, string, pins, things of that nature in case you need to fix or make any of your own tooling on site. Um, you wanna plan for failure. If you're caught with an under the door tool out or a certain device out, how do you get out of that situation? How do you talk your way out of that scenario? Um, some of the uh, scenarios I've played out is, oh, I'm trying to plant this implant, right? And somebody walks in and I say, oh, I'm just doing asset tracking. We couldn't find this on the network. You know, I'm just making sure this is all right. Or I'll say, yeah, I'm just ensuring this device is ready for an upcoming intercom meeting. So, you know, I've got to get the intercom set up and I've got to hook into the network for it for who knows what, right? Um, you want to practice quick deployment. So pulling these tools out of your bag, putting them back in, et cetera. Having those discrete baggage options available is nice. You don't want to roll in there with a tack bag if it's a covert operation. And you also have to look at what is legal slash allowed on your person in case of getting caught. So if you're detained, et cetera, you may be authorized to perform the event test, but you still may be asked to give fingerprints because you have lockpicks on you. So just consider these things. Here's my kit and its approximate usage. A lot of these tools are easy to make or easy to, to procure, so I won't be going over a majority of these, but I'll go over some of the, the harder ones or the... Um, the ones that I can reproduce very cheaply. So what I have here is a Mylar stencil sheet <laughs> and a Dylan's card or a shopper's card, right? And these get me into a lot of places. Uh, it's very funny. And then the rest of the kit is here, all my spare wire. This is the under the door tool, of course. Um, and you know, you have your travel hook and all these like small little nifty tools. <laughs> And then I have some upgrades that I've done uh, based on these videos that I've labeled here. So I do have the Mini J tool produced by the Humble Firefighter. And then I've got the Not So Civil Engineer and Debian Allums mods on my Under the Door tool for dealing with doorknobs and other crash bar type uh, apparatuses. Then there's the electronic stuff, of course, which I do have my implants that I program using the Flipper UART interface. I have wireless cards. I have you know batch cloning stuff, Proxmark Flipper, work for that, um, and a Leatherman. Uh, the Leatherman do put it in your check baggage. Uh, I've lost like two of them so far, and it sucks. I regret that. Talking about under the door tool options, you have a few options here. So you have your standard under the door tool, which is you know this type, 42 inches in length from from that bottom hook. Um, you want to get one that's made out of spring steel or high carbon steel at one four three eighths of an inch, and it's very good. That's going to run you about forty dollars. If you get this, replace the steel cable with a Kevlar cord. Uh, we'll get to that in a sec on, on why that's important. Your zinc rods at Menards or Lowe's or Home Depot will work probably once. Um, they they don't retain their shape well, so after bending them a few times, it, it's pretty terrible uh, to use. You can have the budget low profile ones that not so civil engineering. And I've put the screenshot of their video there. Um, and that consists of copper tubing with a small braided steel cable wire with polymer over that. Um, there's also the takedown under the door tool, which consists of having rods that are pegged together and you screw those in, but that adds a little bit of thickness and it's hard to travel with it in certain compromised scenarios. So as you can see here, here's a little close-up of the tip that I've done for my mod. So this is the one from Not So Civil Engineer. Uh, we've got some heat shrink tubing for better grip, and then we've got the little channel cut out so we can put a Kevlar string that runs down. And then here's the really cheap one, right? So um, you know this one's about $40 uh, right out of the gate, and then you can probably manufacture three of these for about $30. The only downside is you can't really grab doorknobs uh, very easily with this and rotate them the same way. 
Let's talk about shims. So you have your super mic shims, which are suspicious uh, to have on you at times, and you can cut them down to about wallet size. And I only use them to supplement where I would need a longer credit card, right? Um, I like the Dylan's card, it's free, it saves you money in the long term. What accusations are you gonna have if you get caught with it out? Like you're saving money at a gas pump? Cool, like that's, everybody does that, right? Um, and you can use laminated paper as well. I have a, a colleague who does this, but that probably means you lost your shopper's card. It's very thin. Uh, and you'll see when you play with paper versus uh, laminated plastic versus the super mic shims that there's a clear difference in that thickness and strength that it gives. So, so talking about shims, this is how you want to cut them. Um, I have a triangle cut in mine, and this is essentially going into the door uh, to actuate that bevel under there. And then for these types of locks, if you ever want to break into those types of areas, uh, you would use a type of notch here that would grab one of those limbs of that lock and you would close the door and push that card and it'll pop right open. Um, you can see the bulk pack for this. You don't have to pay, you know, $15 for a three pack that's tiny from Red Team Tools. You can just go on Amazon. I recommend about 14 to 16 mil for best results. The one I'll be handing out today is about like 12 mils to 17 mils. So it's around there. Um, but yeah, these help a lot when you have these types of shims and the latches aren't sitting properly. You don't have the dead latches actuated, so you're still able to shim it, but you can't shim it directly, so you have to have that extra length to go under or over. Yeah. Is that video going to play there? Yeah, a little. Oh, okay, cool. It'll do. <coughs> oh, I don't want audio, whatever. Uh, that's fine. <laughs> so as you can see here, I'm taking the Starbucks card and I'm just like going into there. And I'm pulling it up because that, that latch isn't actually properly. Do that. And you're in. Go, oh, right? Like, this is basically the, the gist of Shim, the Lloyd and Grant. What card was that? Oh, that was a star, but no, that's not an endorsement. <laughs> <laughs> Plastic card, generic card, not name brand. Um, talking about strings and cordage, so you can use steel cable that's polymer coated. The problem is this will get torn up and it will cause damage to areas that you don't want to cause damage to. You're at a client site, you're there because they paid you. You don't want to break the goals, right? Um, so definitely you have to inspect it every time. I swap it out with Kevlar rope. Kevlar rope can be concealed easier too. You can uh, sew it into linings, you can put it on your shoelaces, you can do whatever you want and it stores better in my opinion. Uh, you can also use seamstress tape, which can be used to uh, kind of in place of 35 millimeter films and use that to actuate the handle from the top side and the uh, other side. And you can just say you're a fashionista or you're a clothing designer, et cetera, and you're trying to get proper measurements, right? So talking about cordage, you also have your 35 film roll, which uh, Debbie Hollum, Lockpicking the Lawyers, they have a video on it. It's, it's great. You should go check it out. Uh, definitely pack gear ties. Gear ties are great for folding up your equipment and being able to deploy rapidly. Talking about wire, uh, you want to have electrical style DuPont connectors. Those come in handy. Have some alligator clips in case you do need to do any electrical work on the fly. I personally try not to because that's a, an area I don't want to get into on site. Uh, but I still have the wire just in case. For physical tooling, I recommend about two millimeter thick wire, pliable and capable of holding its own weight. Uh, disassembling barbed wire, real estate signs, state sales signs, fence wire will get you this as a result. Uh, talking about picks, really quick. Uh, lock picks, they're not always accessible. Uh, they may be banned in certain countries, certain uh, localities. Um, spring steel is where your high quality ones come from. Uh, you can use bobby pins or windshield wipers. You just have to make sure to fashion them a little bit. And I'll show you that here in a second. There's a bunch of tutorials. This isn't anything new, right? So you'll take your bobby pins, you'll have the, the bobs on the end, and then you'll cut those off. And you make sure you file these down because I don't want you to stab yourself. I've stabbed myself multiple times with these. Uh, and you uh, unfold them, you know, use them however you need for those picks. But, oh, okay, maybe you can't use that pretext. Maybe you're bald and you don't have any bobby pins. That's cool. You can use windshield wiper in inserts. I went to O'Reilly's after a rainy day and got all these uh, for a recommendation from a friend in, in South Dakota. And you can basically take these inserts and just heat treat them because they're normal steel and then fold them into picks or shape them down to picks. So I've got a tension wrench here. I've got a pick here. This is a little thin, the more thin than I'd like. With steel, you want to heat it, bend it, and then quench it in water, use motor oil. And then here's me disinfecting them because it came out of a dumpster. Again. You, know, like, okay. uh, you can also use bra wire. This is some pretty hefty stuff. It's pretty good. Uh, talking about keys. Uh, common keys are nice. They 
have key replicators online where you can replicate your keys using a working key. And they're easy to use. I learned how to use one within two minutes. It's not too bad. I bought one at an auction for five bucks. You can buy your default common keys and you can share them throughout your community. And now, oh, cool, all your friends have these default common keys and it's a widespread issue. And then now manufacturers start changing it and implementing security stuff because, oh, wait, maybe we should get right? Um, you can buy stuff off eBay. If you find a seller that is maybe selling the keys, you can copy them and then just send the keys back. Don't, I mean, I'm not going to suggest you do that, but uh, it's just something you could do. Talking about common keys, for bump keys, I personally use Goat Bandit Kits. Uh, I don't know if some of you are familiar with this. Uh, we are near the Kansas area. Uh, growing up, we did see a lot of these. So these will be used to actuate your key whenever you are uh, bumping a lock open. So here I have those bump keys cut out for you and you can see kind of the pins and where those, those stand. And your hammer can be a variety of different things. If it's more stiff, it's gonna be louder, but it's going to transfer the energy better. So, and we'll see some demos that are quite humorous in a second. Cool, so as you can see here, I have the normal key, the working key, right? Turn the lock, right? And then I have the bump keys in the background and I have goat banding kit on it, a little goat band uh, on that. So I'll take this bump key and the goal is to just put it inside the goat band and then put it on the key or on the lock and then go ahead and bump it with something rigid. In this case, because I don't care if I get caught, et cetera. Of course it was like a fast forward button, it's okay. So looking at this, well, it's a very damaged band but they're very cheap to find online. So I think with this one, I use the screwdriver the back of uh, one of your fancy screwdrivers real quick. Yep, there we go. So just going to apply very light tension, tap it a few times, and it's open. Right. And what that does is it's actuating all the pins. I mean, you can talk to people from the lock picking village. I'm terrible at lock picking and lock smithing. So, uh, you know, definitely get more specifics on that. So that's one option for a bump hammer, but at the same time, if I have such a bump hammer, if I'm out here and, you know, it's late at night and uh, I'm sitting here bumping a hammer, trying to get a door open, etc., and I turn around and I have something like this bump hammer in my hand, I turn around to an armed guard, it's, uh, you know, like, it's not going to go too well. I may be eating lead at that point in time. So you have to be careful, right? How do you disarm a situation uh, that would require uh, a good amount of intervention? There's the route of perversion. And as you'll see here, you can have such phallic implements <laughs> to perform these same rituals. This one is printed out of ASA plastic. It's, uh, it's resistant to ultraviolet light. Uh, it's very rigid. It makes a lot of noise. I printed this one with 20% 20, 20 infill. At the time I recorded this video, it was probably 1 a.m. I got back home. It was hot off the press. So I go, and there, it's open. Um, and you can do this with just about anything. You can do it with your phone. But the reason for doing it with such a device is to go the route of Persian. You can use a silicon one too. You can use a polyurethane. I have issues with the silicon one, personally, because the energy transfer is uh, hard for me. It's a skill issue on my part, I'll be honest. But as you can see there, it just opens right up and, and there you go. Uh, but if you, you essentially are in a position where the guard's looking at you and you turn around, you say, you start banging on the door with it. Oh, my boyfriend and I, we, we just broke up. <laughs> The guard would feel really bad for shooting you. I mean, it's not like they're a threat to your life, right? It's, it's more so, oh, this is something that I'm not trained to handle. This is a route of perversion. I don't touch this at work. Uh, in the case that my, uh, my friend had recounted to me this story, the guard left. He just like walked back to his, his car and just left. So, yeah, um, I really tried to use the silicon one. I couldn't get video with silicon one because to this day I can't use the silicon one. I'm going to experiment with polyurethane. But the ASA one works great. It's just going to be loud. Um, it's very funny. You can also try to explain, expense it to the client and, you know, see what they say. Uh, but those rigid ones are going to be noisier is the thing. So this dropped a couple days ago and I hadn't, like, known about this technique. Uh, this is about cloning keys on a fly with casting. So this one, this is the replicant. You can pay $90 for the cool kit, which I recommend you do if you're in the profession, you can get your company to pay for it. But like I'm broke, you know, like I, I'm poor, I'm tall, right? I couldn't afford the, the OR. So if you look here, you have some woods metal, which is lead type alloy with bismuth or some other stuff and has a low melting point. Um, I had Sarasafe on hand because of another project. 
So I take this aero safe and also notice the lead content. Please do be very careful and ventilate your areas with this. Um, and I found this 3D printed model that somebody had online uh, that you can go and print. And it's a, it's a perfect frame for this, right? So I printed out the Sculpey 3 polymer clay that ships with that that replicant is like four or five dollars at right? Joanne Fabrics. They were having a sale, so I got a few of them for four dollars. And you can see here what I'm doing is I'm just prepping this little mold tray with the clay. And then after I will put, I use baking powder. Some people say you use talcum powder. I was like, hey, baking powder looks similar, right? It's got to do something. It did do something. It worked. So as you can see here, I have the key tucked into bed nicely. I put it there for a few seconds, like let the imprint get there. You don't want to squeeze it massively. You just want to squeeze it to the point these two ends are touching. Um, for casting, you then have this. You have to set the air channel. I target the back of the key and just run it up so that all the metal can go down. The air goes out. Some of you are a lot better at metallurgy than I am. So, you know, take this and run with it. And you can see there's a, a feeble attempt here that looks a bit... Uh, Suspicious, and uh, you know some people might be <laughs> a bit curious about that. So yeah, here I'm just heating up this Cero safe. It's bismuth alloy, and it takes a little bit to go. So we might have a bit of an awkward silence. I'm using a can full of used Cero safe, and then some honey dust, which we'll get to in a second on why that's important. After uh, I've got a little lighter, it takes a while. You see it start liquidating. You want to get it all uh, liquidy uh, to the point where you can pour it. And you can see I've got a gear tie. That's what that black thing is around the, the mold. And I've got that holding it together. That way it's not applying too much pressure. Because if you apply too much pressure, you have a little too much clay. I've failed on this a bunch of times in the like one hour I spent on it, uh, you know, that night. But uh, if you have too much pressure, it'll override your air channel and compress it, and then you won't get metal through, right? So this attempt specifically, like there's no key. When, when that goes in, there is none of that going into the key part besides that handle. So I had to redo this several times. Um, and here's the result of that. It's definitely a skill issue. I think practice makes decent in this case. And, you know, that's what you need. So I essentially have my air channels there. It's also a different type of clay. This is Sculpey 3. The one I used in the previous video was Sculpey Primo. I don't recommend Sculpey Primo. It just has weird properties that make it a bit more dense, tough to work with. It's not as pliable. So as you can see here, it's a bit... Uh, malformed, so I have to rock it kind of upwards, and now it turns, and now you have a working key that you replicated in it. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, zero to casting uh, in less than an hour, uh, plus a three-minute video, right? So, it's not too bad. Uh, oops, good. Okay, so let's talk about crash bar hooks. Uh, crash bar hooks are meant to actuate crash bars from the outside in, um, and it makes it think that the door is opening from the inside, but it's not, right? You can make your own. There are titanium bars that are three millimeters that you can buy online and then realtor signs. They have wireframes that can be used and certain hangers can be used. Here I tried a feeble attempt at a, a crash bar hook, right? And this first steps and then second, third, and that's how it ends up, right? You have your original uh, crash bar hook and then you have the one I made out of a, a single hanger and some thread and some tape. Um, this one has about a 20, the one at the top has about a 20 pound pull until it really starts deforming and bending, but it snaps back to the steel. Uh, the one below it has like a five pound one before it just completely breaks. But you know, if it's a five pound crash bar, cool. Uh, there's also the double door tool or double door tool, J tool uh, setup. You can follow the humble firefighter. She has a J tool mini homemade with specifications there. If Post it on screen directly from the video. Uh, with titanium, you have to heat it red, bend it, and then let it air cool or sand punch it. And then with your steel, you have to do the heat up. You have to then bend it and then uh, water punch it or use motor oil punch it so it doesn't shatter, so it's not too brittle, right? So you can see here, this was when I was in Austin. There's a public park with a parking facility. So this is what you would actuate. This is the inside looking out, right? So you'd come through the middle and you'd open it. But more importantly than that, Five feet away was an open door. So uh, always check your surround. It's, it's always the easiest stuff, right? And here's a, a little video. Hopefully this says audio. This is the audio. Uh, this is the APT they warned you about. This is who is coming for your data. So that's the titanium rod there. So that's me, Ben, and I do go and sand quench it. The sand I have is a bit moist, but it's still a bit the drink. You don't want to quench it in water or use motor oil. But just kind of let it go. 
There's a spring back effect when you're bending titanium. So if you want it at a 90 degree angle, you do have to go a bit uh, sharper and you have to allow it to spring back at that point. So you bend it about down to here and then it'll spring back up to 90 degrees. So talking about forensic tools such as finding keypad touches to get into your, your digit uh, gated communities, etc., or uh, facilities, you can have uh, the dust online that is sold that's ultraviolet and you can find it uh, you know, available for $13, etc. Or for the same price, you can have something that's cooler and has more excuses for it being out, right? Um, if you have this little dust on you, the one at the top, I mean, like, how do you how do you hide that, right? If, if it, you get investigated and you, the officials are looking at, like, why do you have this dust? Like, what does it do? It's just kind of, you're, you're goose cooked. Um, but at the same time, you have honey dust, which is a sucrose-based powder, very fine granules. It's normally meant for sensory pleasures, uh, right? <laughs> You can use cornstarch, you can use baking powder or powdered sugar, but the granules are not as small and not as effective. And I'll show you a demo here with a keypad. So we've got a clean keypad here. I've cleaned it to the best of my ability after numerous attempts at failing. And I'm just showing you based off the light reflecting, you know, how it doesn't look like there's any grease on it, right? Um, and I'm going to go ahead and type in a code. So. Remember that, that's the passcode for everything I use. So if you if anybody wants to hack me, that's it. So and you can see the grease marks already, right? Without any powder applied. It's just kind of obvious that my finger has been there because of those ridges. So then you want to dust for those prints. Essentially what I did is I, I basically just threw the dust at the pad with this feather duster. Uh, you can use a makeup applicator as well, foundation. Um, and you can see how the dust accumulates on those ridges of human oils. And you kind of wipe off the top. You don't want to be too rough with the wiping because then you'll start getting all of the dust off of there. But you can notice here, like two of those ridges at the top. Okay, the, the four has some ridges and then six has some ridges. And then seven's a little harder to spot, but it's still there, right? And another method you can use is a yellow highlighter. So if you have a yellow highlighter and a UV light, I make a little X over each little dot. You get the point, I'm just gonna fast forward. So I'll make that X over each dot, and then it looks like this. And once somebody touches it, you'll notice ridges accumulate where those disturbances occur on the X's. So my internet just crapped out. That's fine. And you can notice here those ridges. Uh, at that point, you can examine and make all the permutations you want and attempt uh, however you want to play it. So talking about door alarms, uh, sometimes you'll encounter door alarms that are magnetic read switches. Um, KJ Magnetics have some good stuff. Uh, the Amazon ones can work for demonstration purposes, but I don't recommend them for actual field testing things. Okay, so we've got a couple of devices here. So I've got my geodiamond magnet. Oh, just mute it. Real very strong one. So yeah, you're fine on the, just the, on the video. So just mute it. Then I've got so this thing. I forgot what it's called. It's a uh, text magnetic field. So you can essentially use it. So you want to check the polarity. A little comment on this is the uh, this specific lock or the specific alarm is very cheap and was just accepting any polarity. I realized that like after I filmed uh, the video, but I thought it was very funny. So you essentially just want to replicate that side of the polarity for this alarm. I've got a tape because it is annoying as hell to have a small enclosed space. So you take this. You're about to do magic. Yeah, and right, it's about magnetic levitation and all that. So the theory is slipping a magnet in between there and then you're able to open the door. How you do this is you can get an air wedge. Those allow you to make more gaps or greater gaps in doorways. You can also use a small, small pry bar. I don't pack a pry bar except on my keychain, and it's a very tiny one that's about this big. So, and uh, actually, can you turn the audio back on real quick? I just realized like there's no sound so you can't hear it you know, actuating and going up. Yeah, sorry about that. So. So you'll see how there's mess it up. I guess not. Cool. Yes, I thought it's like your dip was on. So talking about HID, uh, this is like something I get a lot of questions on. I'm not a very good researcher when it comes to HID. I use kind of what's out there and what works. I have numerous tools, uh, but worst comes to worst, depending on the protocol, you can just reduce your toolkit to Arduino shields and work with open source projects. 
Um, but I do have like the Chameleon Pro, Flipper Zero, uh, all those things are, are pretty cool for cloning those cards and doing brute force attacks. I also have a Proxmark 3, but I pull that out more for um, the research scenarios or when I've encountered a card I haven't looked at before. And you can make your own antennas uh, for those longer range engagements where you can get like a foot out in terms of distance. Great Scott has a video on this and uh, checking impedance for the coil and, and trying to maximize the distance uh, based on these cheap uh, knockoffs on eBay. So talking about disguises, I have what's in my hand as, uh, you know, cosplayed as a bump hammer earlier. Uh, this is a Z-Ink printer, and this is really cool. I got this a couple weeks ago uh, for making your badges on the fly. It's a 2 by 3 Z-Ink printer, and it costs about $60 online. You know, you can buy replacement cartridges for $50 for about $20. Um, and essentially, I just take my blank badges and we'll make something on my phone. This was edited in, like, Snapchat's editor, uh, and I just printed it out. And it prints out within 15 seconds, 30 seconds. So something on the fly that you can carry uh, that is pretty nice. If you do have such an ID card or a badge that you're trying to falsify and you have the pretext of somebody who's worked there forever, do run it into the ground, do apply wear and tear to it. It's not going to look good if it looks all new and shiny and, oh, you've been with the company for 10 years, right? So yeah, shop around to Goodwill, uh, get swag, lanyards, all that collected so you can reuse it uh, on later your engagements or sneak in a dev conference, right? Talking about USB implants, uh, these are cool. So you do have your own reductees, of course, but you can get cheaper if you just rely on HID utilities. So this DigiSpark Bad USB uh, comes out to about a dollar when you buy a pack of five. So at that point, you can not feel bad about leaving these on client engagements. You can plug it in and say, okay, set it, forget, we're not gonna touch it. Um, I don't feel bad about that. Uh, $70 rubber ducky, yeah, like that sucks. I could have had an extra rubber ducky, but whatever, right? And you do have multiple implements. You have the Pwn Pi Loa, which is based on the Pi Zero W. Uh, that one does have air gap bypasses and different utilities that I've used before that are pretty cool. Uh, what I did specifically was I had USB cables that were soldered, so these are all conjoined, came out to a USB connector, and I just was talking to an IT technician while I was sitting there behind with their computer, they're all in one, just plugging it in. And I was like, where the fuck is this USB port? <laughs> we got it in and then uh, left. And then I forgot about the implant until like a month later. And I was like, oh, forgot I had a shell on that. Uh, you can also use the Logitech dongles. Uh, you would have to require uh, set up for the encryption keys for Logitech hacker. Uh, this would allow you to perform those operations and remote keystroke injections without uh, compromising your security and having clear text communications. Talking about network monitoring, network taps, I use these little orange pine type boards and just wait until Armbian releases on them. So these are pretty nice. You can use uh, Mac spoofing on them to spoof Macs, printers, your VoIP phones, etc., or VoIP systems. Uh, you can add your buttons as you see fit. So on mine, I have GPIO buttons so that when I click something, it will start packet capture mode on that interface and it'll go to monitor mode, et cetera. And then I can go click and then it'll switch to a, oh, okay, I'll connect and then I'll, I'll either give myself a static IP or DHCP and then exfil out. So in terms of tapping, uh, network connections, you do have your physical implementations such as the Ninja's Throwing Star. Do keep in mind that if you use the Throwing Star, it's going to downgrade the connection speed to 100 megabits per second. You won't get that gigabit performance. That's just how that passive tap works. Uh, you can see my money spread here. This is at some point in time worth like $400. Um, your active connections with power will be able to read those gigabit, uh, that gigabit data from the wire. And if you do want some type of powered network tap for gigabit connections, you can spend $230 on a Wireshark thing. Or those of you who manage switches, et cetera, and know how switches work, you can just buy a $27 managed switch and just do port mirroring. Like, it's not that bad. And this, in a network closet, looks a lot less conspicuous than this connected to some weird 3D printed case and, oh, I don't know where it goes. So just keep that in mind. Talking about wireless, uh, Josh Campbell, actually has his little wireless hacking notes if you want to scan that QR code and get access to that. Shout out Josh Campbell, that's a cool little workshop, visit him in RF Village. But essentially, you do have the ability to uh, use uh, your Hack5 pineapples, etc. but they have failed me in the past at critical times. So what I've done is I've just said, okay, screw this, I'm going to work on Linux and have better cap going, I'll have TCP done, I'll have all these packet captures going and know how to manually perform these attacks. And I've been way better off ever since that. So make your own solutions. Ponagachi is great. Uh, there are two forks right now that, that work and you're able to swap out the network interface so you can connect it to an external USB network interface um, and take full PCAPs while you're doing all these deauth attacks so you can attribute your yourself to your client. 
And here's some homemade antennas stuff from the internet. Um, you've seen the Yagi's, there are plenty of tutorials online. I'm not going to get into that. Um, normally I'm in the parking lot just snipping from there. So here's a resource dump. And these are where I got a lot of the resources from on, on specifications and the manufacturing of these tools. So you can check that out. Physical Security Village from DEF CON, they have a good amount of bypass games on their website. You can check them out for sure. Uh, Humble Firefighter has a great playlist on uh, respectful entry for firefighters. And looking at these other provisions allows you to uh, gain that insight and knowledge. So the takeaways from this talk are essentially to be resourceful, become ungovernable, and once you've learned a concept and how to execute such a concept, go back and repeatedly perform the concept with worse and worse tools every time. So you're more than familiar with the concept. Stay out of trouble and you know, come and visit OSSEC. It's a conference we have in Wichita. So uh, definitely check it out. It's a, I help organize, I'm Game Master, I run CTF. So I uh, would definitely appreciate y'all having uh, us watching them out there. So I was told to put this at the end. I don't endorse these person's services. I just endorse them for thank you for sponsoring Set KC and giving me a spot to perform. I, I'm not. That's not. You know, I'm not paid by them. Um, but the for the venue and everything. Thank you, everybody, and the volunteers and staff uh, who put this on. This has been a great experience. Um, but any questions? I thought I had a question slide, but I just clicked and it's not there. Do let's do questions. Yeah, can we have questions from the audience? Yes. Uh, would you be able to go to the first slide so we can get the PDF? <coughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's. Uh, I wonder if I go backwards if it'll just start playing the videos. I can skip those again. Cool. There you go. You can take that. Um, yeah, there are specifications there. Any other questions? Come on, don't be shy. It's cool. Ask me stuff. Ask me whatever you want. Yeah, you got time to kill. Yeah, yeah. What, what time is it? Uh, I don't know. I, know. I, I still got time to kill. Yeah. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. I definitely blazed through that. That was normally a one hour presentation. Uh, no questions, really? No, no. More than that. Oh, sorry. Right, yeah. You had a few race. You were hot stories. Yeah, um, so that time I was playing in the help desk, uh, I was just talking there. So essentially, imagine your help desk person is right here and it's a lower elevated desk and they have the all-in-one with USB ports on the back exposed. And I was just talking, I was just you know, sat, sit, sitting here fiddling with my hands and I was just like, oh, cool, whatever. And then once I got it plugged in, I kind of like sat back for a second and I started popping PowerShell and trying to do like fast, fast payloads. He's like, do you know anything about PowerShell? I was like, what? He was like, yeah, you know, I, I keep seeing like PowerShell pop up. Is that like you or something? Because they know, I, at that point, I was an internal red teamer. So they were like, oh, you're up to no good or something. I was like, I don't know. I'm not on the clock right now. I just I got to clock in like 15 minutes. Uh, and that one was was pretty fair and caught. Uh, there was this one time in a state where I was doing a, a more covert operation with a buddy. And we were told to go to this distribution area where we would walk in and there'd be a locked IT closet in the back. Uh, sorry, you're getting a two for one right now. I'm sorry, but we were short on time. Cool. Um, so we were given some swag from this vendor and they were like, here, take some hats, take a sweater, like, you know, just wear this and just go in and see to inspect the IT closet, which hooks into uh, an electrical grid. <laughs> so um, we get there. We walk in, and I'm going to hell because I'm a social engineer to Midwestern woman. Well, we get there, we're saying, hey, you know, we're with IT, and we're, we're wanting to check out the network closet like, that's in the back. It's locked. Uh, could you kind of show us where that is? And they're like, oh, yeah, that's in, that's in this office over here. Normally it's locked, but or the main office is locked, but this time it's open because the IT admin was away. So that was a stroke of, like, opportunity luck. Like, we didn't do the research on that. We were just like, let's do this. Ready to go. So we walk back there, and the IT closet inside that office is, is locked. And we're like, okay, I have the tools to bypass this right now. But the person standing right behind me, who's like, oh, you're from IT, cool, whatever. I get to the door, I'm about to like take out the, the Slim Jim from my sleep. And she says, oh, do you need a key? <laughs> and I was like, I would love a key. That'd be great. So she goes and gets a key. She's like, I have a phone call that's coming right now. Let me go get that key and I'll get back to you after the call. So we have a couple of minutes, uh, but we didn't know that. So like, okay, that's awesome. So we're just sitting there and I'm fumbling. I'm fumbling with this, this slump gym. I, I didn't get the wrong side. I'm like, oh gosh, I wasn't ready for this to happen. Um, and I eventually I get it open. I pop the door open and she comes back like 30 seconds later. She's like, oh, y'all got in just fine. And I was like, yeah, I forgot, you know, like X person name and whatever company gave me a key when I came down here. I was just in my backpack. Like, sorry about that. I didn't know. Um, so yeah, we got in there, plugged into the network. And um, we actually call our contacts 
uh, from the band because they were just sitting in the band. They're like, let's see if you know they get kicked out or something. And then we're like, hey, come in. Like we, you know, like we want you to help us like know where we are on the network. And I plugged into the network, and they're like, yeah, that's the backbone that like connects to all the RTUs and stuff. And I was like, yeah, I just hooked in. And like, cool, we're here. And, all right, cool. And so yeah, that was a that was a very nerve wracking one, and I just felt so bad because. Midwestern people are so sweet, like, and we love to help, right? Um, and I'm not saying that it's something terrible, it's just, you know, in certain scenarios, it might not be the best thing, uh, especially when you have, like, somebody like me. At that time, I wasn't very covert about it, and I had a full tag guy with me. My buddy was dressed up with the, you know, we had the hats, et cetera, so. Uh, but, yeah, I'd say those those were the, the funniest ones, that, in my opinion, so far. Any other questions? Yeah, what's up? I noticed you didn't mention rack sensor attacks at all. Is that because those are becoming less effective because, you know, um, system integrators are becoming aware of that to stop using rack sensors or good ones that you can't bypass or you know, just not going to get this Oh, yeah, no, that's a good question. So, in terms of rack sensors, I mentioned it because the last time we did a rack sensor attack, the bottle uh, or the spray can bottle of that computer duster costs like 20 bucks. It was at a dollar general and normally it's like four dollars, but they cost 20 bucks there. And we we're like, well, I can't say come out here, say make stuff with trash and then it's that. But uh, yeah, we've, we've definitely used the computer duster. Um, I have heard of colleagues in cases using certain adult shaped objects to pass under and then inflating for that heat displacement uh, to get through doors. Um, but of course, you can uh, do with that what you will, right? So, but yeah, um, that might be something I add in the future. It just hasn't come up in an engagement where it got uh, too advanced, right? Uh, normally, loiting is a great way to get in, or just being led in. Half the engagements I'm on in terms of uh, physical entry is just, oh, I don't pull out a tool except an implant because I'm already inside. Cool. But yeah, did that answer your question? Yeah. Cool. Uh, you had a question? Yeah, uh, where do you find all these different tools you use? Do you look for them, or is there like a place you know where to look for them? Yeah, like, uh, you know, benching, like Lockpick, Lawyer, Debbie, all along, all the it's not so civil engineers. Um, sometimes you manufacture your own, like with the J tools, so it's not really, I mean, you could probably find the shop online, but it's titanium wire you can order, or uh, you can order from Amazon. Um, in terms of innovating tools, you just kind of like see what the problem is that you're trying to solve. There are some that I haven't presented here because I have a colleague who was like, hey, I have this idea for a tool and we have 3D printed mockups and stuff. We're still going shopping stuff. Uh, but yeah, just essentially seeing how other people do stuff and sharing stories and sharing that knowledge mm -hmm. and saying, okay, how can I do that better? Like, oh, okay, you got in with approximate theory. How can I get in, you know, with this this uh, flipper zero? Just, you know, oh, cool, it's the same protocol, my fair one, okay, cool. We're going. Uh, did that answer your question? Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. You touched a little bit about the RFID. Uh, I'm just curious. How well do you think that Faraday bags work? Faraday bags? Um. So I haven't encountered anybody using Faraday bags defensively. I have a couple of myself and have done some tests. Um, the, there's been some that I've bought that are more Faraday bags for cell phones. But generally, yeah. If you interrupt like high frequency RFID. Um, it's very effective because you already have to be very close to that, and to have some missile in front of that, you may not. Plus, you you may not be able to get a proper read for the duration you need to crack those keys. So, how far do you think? Oh, high frequency. Usually, the max I've seen, the max I've gotten at working, is probably like four inches. It's not. It's okay. not very far. Um, but I mean, you could probably amp that up with low frequency. You'll find people online who are making readers for you know a foot or two feet, and they'll try to max it out. Um, the normal flipper one that I have, I think uh, I've gotten probably like 10 centimeters or no, I'd say, I'd say more than that, probably like about like that far. It's worked for me. Yeah, I don't know how to measure them though. So, so do you think the parallel bags work pretty well? Yeah, yeah for your, your high frequency stuff. Um, there was a, actually an engagement where we were debating, uh, one of the workers had a flipper and they had their card saved on the flipper. And we were like, is that a security issue? And we thought the flipper only actuates that signal it only relays it whenever you tell it go. It's not just always passive, right? So it's more secure, technically, depending on your threat model, is more secure than just having a normal badge. Because, you know, passively you can't walk to somebody and, oh, hey, let me scan your flipper, right? It's, they have to activate that and say, okay, patch me in. Uh, but yeah, like, you know, your Faraday, Faraday bags, definitely test it, right? You can try to read your card with your phone, and you can have your Faraday bag that you want to test, and you can say, okay, does it work with my card? 
um, and see if the NFC, you know, you have NFC utility apps that will try to read the card. And if it bumps and it says, oh, there's a card there, I can't decrypt it, you, you know, let's try and read it at least. So, Thank you. yeah, no problem. Any other questions? I, I saw some other hands. Thought I did, at least. Oh, oh, sorry. I was looking for this. It's my phone. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean. That's my ask. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, I don't know. We we can test it if you want, but uh, <laughs> uh, as long as you're cool with that. But um, any other questions?